On this project here, as Dr. Artington mentioned, is another component from the Florida Cattlemen's Grant that we received last year. Um, and just some history behind this project, if you are not really familiar with lean progress. In 2014, uh, IFAS, we as a group with the agronomy department and some research centers, we released two new cultivars. We used to have Floralta and we have now Gibtuck and can high. So those were like five-year projects that we did to enhance and increase production and nutritive value of limpo grass. Assuming that limpo grass we think here for South Florida is a very important forage and although it doesn't have the acreage of bahia grass, we assume that it is as important as bahia grass because we use limpo grass during the winter and that's when we have a problem, right? In the summer, everybody's happy, but in the winter, we have shortage of forage, and limpo grass is a great grass for the winter. So we released these two new cultivars that we have pretty good evidence. They are much superior to the traditional Floralta that we had in the past. And with that done, so that was spread around the producers here. We have several producers here that got the limpo grass. And then we have this idea of try to expand the project and try to find one of these new cultivars that will be more efficient to grow. Um, I will ask a question, you can say yes or no. So do you think fertilizer will get any cheaper? Is fertilizer the, probably the biggest cost in your forage production? So I think that was pretty clear with all the clientele that we work with. We all know here, if we apply fertilizer, the grass will grow. But we don't do that because of the response of the grass. We do that uh, as much as we can afford, right? It's a cost limitation. It's not because we think that we apply fertilizer, the grass will not grow. It's because we cannot afford. So with that in mind, we are trying to identify among the cultivars of limpo grass that we have, the one that will be the most efficient to use fertilizer. What that means is, like if you are familiar with uh, RFI in cattle, we have cattle they eat a lot and gain a lot. We have cattle they eat less and they still gain a lot of weight, or cattle that don't eat and don't gain any weight. So we are trying to identify here one of these cultivars that will use the fertilizer more efficiently, so we'll produce more forage with less fertilizer. That is the objective. We have pretty good evidence among the cultivars that we have, the Gibtuck is one of the new cultivars, is more productive than any other thing that we have. We have this trial here, here in Gainesville and Mariana. Okay, three very different places. And Gibtuck is the best in the three places. And from the preliminary data that you can see in your proceedings, Gibtuck did better with high fertilizer or low fertilizer. That is a pretty good indication that that grass is efficient to grow even with a limited amount of fertilizer. What we don't know is for how long we can keep fertilizing this grass with very limited amount and the grass will survive? I think that's the question. For how long can we do that and the grass will not die? That is our first question. We have three questions. The second one is more on the basic science, probably is not very exciting for most of you, but we in the literature have found that corn and rice, they have some genes on their DNA, and that gene is related to nitrogen use efficiency. That means they found a, a rice plant that has a gene that's called RBCS. When they test that grass, that grass grew better with no nitrogen. They did the same with corn. So they identified some genes in corn that when you apply less nitrogen, that plant grew as much as the plant that received a lot of nitrogen, just with that gene testing. 
So when you go in the literature for lymphograms, you have nothing, right? We don't have that information. But what we're trying to do, we are trying to get the corn model and the rice model and some wheat models that we also have and try to find the same genes on the lymphograms. If we can find a plant that will have a, a, a pretty significant expression of one of the three genes that we are looking for, and that plant will grow efficiently, we know that from now on, we don't need to do a lot of selection over time. We can find a plant, test the DNA. If it has the gene, we have a pretty good chance that that plant will fit well for us because we will need less nitrogen to make that plant to grow. And that's the objective, right? To fertilize less and have the same production. That's the objective. And the third objective of this trial is we have one cultivar that is called number one. Number one, it was number one because we have 103 plants. And number one, as you can imagine, it was number one. So it came all the way through the selection process after five years, always between the best. And it was not released because when we compare to Floralta, number one was not better in production and not better in nutritive value as Gibtuck and can high work. So it was a good grass, but didn't bring anything additional to Floralta. But what we have seen, you know, we, I have harvested those plants for three years every six weeks. So get to the point that you get some attachment to the things, you start getting the plots really close. And we found that that number one grows differently from the other plants. It was very unique. And the thing is, it grows really close to the ground. And that may be the case that it doesn't have a lot of production. We harvest at seven inches stubble height. You may left a lot of forage close to the ground that I didn't harvest, right? But on the other hand, because it grows really close to the ground, the plant protects itself. So we have a theory that that number one may not produce a lot, may not be a better nutritive value, but it may be more persistent than the plant that will have a lot of upright growth and the cattle weed at all. So we know that work with lymphograss, we know that we have few problems on persistence, right? If we don't take care of the lymphograss, what's happening? Bahia grass will come and take over. That is probably the main uh, constraint that we have with these lymphograss fields is to getting out common Bermuda or Bahia grass out of the field. So we assume that if number one prove after three, four years that it is more persistent, it may have merit, you know, for us to release a new cultivar that in theory right now, but hopefully will materialize after we finish the trial, will be more persistent. So that's, those are the three main objectives of this trial and we assume that we are collecting the first year now three locations and we'll keep doing that for another two additional years so and then we'll bring some new knowledge in these three areas that i mentioned to you so does anybody has any questions on the on the lymphograss management or comments why does why does that have more um vegetation other than the grass? Um, if you look at this plot here, that's just an example, you know, this plot here, can you see that this side here is taller? Here is taller, and here is shorter, and here it has much more weeds than here. This part here is harvested every six weeks, and this part here is harvested every 12 weeks. We have to include a harvest frequency treatment because on previous work that Maria did here, right here, with lymphograss, it shows the harvest frequency can be as important or more important than fertilization. So if you keep harvesting the lymphograss every six weeks, very hard, you're sh grazing really short, you're going to end up with this scenario here. So it's a grass that don't like to be harvested very often 
or graze it very short. On the fertilizer rate? Yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, we have two treatments on fertilizer. One, we are trying to replace everything that we take from the plant. When we harvest here, we assume that we're gonna harvest 80 pounds of nitrogen, 20 pounds of uh, phosphorus, and, and 70 pounds of potassium because of the amount of forage that we take out of the field. That is the full rate. But we have a treatment that we just provide half. That means that plant will be deficient because we harvest those plants every six weeks or 12 weeks. So after we harvest like for a year now, the plant will be deficient because we are taking up and removing more nutrients than we should return. But we want to see if some of these cultivars will be better under that stressful condition. But have you, uh, have you ever uh, looked into crabgrass at all? Is crabgrass a useful forage here in Florida at all? Have you looked into it? Um, I think crabgrass is not a bad thing. But there are a lot of limitations. Uh, people end up here with crabgrass by accident, right? You ended up with crabgrass because something that you planted didn't grow, but crabgrass is still there. It has very good nutritive value, right? It has. Horses like it and cattle like it. The problems with crabgrass is, are, because there are a few, it is the shortest uh, growing season. So it's the one that gets cold and is the first one to stop. So if you have a crabgrass, a good crabgrass pasture that you think it's good, maybe a good pasture to overseed with ryegrass because it will go away pretty fast in the fall. So you can use that to overseed with ryegrass. The tonnage here in Florida is not comparable to even bahia grass. So you lose tonnage there, so it may not be the best production, although the nutritive value is very good, right? And the other problem is one day, you decide to plant something else. Let's say you, you are not producing enough or it goes out too quick, you try to plant bahia grass. And then you have a huge problem because that crabgrass produces a lot of seeds. There is no very limited herbicide to control. And every time that you try to plant something else, crabgrass will come first. So probably you're gonna marry the crabgrass, you'll be there forever and you'll be a problem to get rid of it. So those are, are some of the problems of using crabgrass, but it's a good forage. It has very good nutritive value. So sometimes if you have that, I, I tell people just use it right and it's a good forage.